Jack Evans, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. People who've known you for a long time say you've always wanted to be mayor of this city. Why would you tell voters you want to be mayor? Well, I want to be mayor because, as you know, I've been on the council 23 years now. I've been in the city over 35 years. And we've seen a remarkable turnaround in this city. When I came on the council back in 1991, the city was really in trouble. Uh, our finances were really a wreck. Uh, our downtown largely deserted. Economic development had come to a halt. Uh, our bond rating had fallen. People were leaving the city. Uh, we were really in a, a situation analogous to where Detroit is today. And over the course of time, we've really rebuilt our city, uh, revitalized it. Today, we're one of the most dynamic cities in America today. And I want to be mayor because only in the mayor's job do I believe I can address some of the issues that are still outstanding in our city. And secondly, to bring the prosperity that our city is now enjoying to people all across the city. And again, as the council member, I've had a great run. But only as mayor do I believe I can accomplish for our city what needs to be done. So give us some of the ways that you would do that, that you would create more jobs for more people throughout the city and not just in pockets of the yeah. city. Well, there are really four areas I want to focus on. And again, schools being one, uh, crime, because we've seen a spike in that lately, uh, affordable housing, which is really critical, and jobs, which you just mentioned. And I'll start with jobs. Uh, and, and it's something that I have done so efficiently and well throughout my career here. And I would say nobody running for mayor, including the current mayor, has created as many jobs in our city as I have. You start with some of the big projects I worked on, like the Convention Center and the uh, MCI Center, which is now the Verizon Center, and the baseball stadium. All created construction and working jobs. And the best example I can give you right now is the Convention Center Hotel. That is a deal I put together. And in doing that, part of the deal was that 51% of all the jobs in the uh, new hotel must be district residents, about 600 jobs. And so when that hotel opens up in May, uh, we will have, because we've been training, we had about 2,000 applications, training hundreds of our residents for jobs from entry level up. And I, I mention entry level because there's a lot of residents of our city who need entry level jobs, who are, uh, can't find those jobs in our city. And 600 district residents will be employed come May, who didn't have jobs before. Just one example of many that I would do as mayor to get our, in, our, our, our residents back to work. It was a fierce fight over the minimum wage here in the city. And as you know, Barbara Lang, the outgoing president of the DC Chamber of Commerce, has expressed a great deal of concern that DC is sending uh, closed for business signals to businesses that want to locate here in terms of those that would need to hire minimum wage workers and that we're giving the advantage especially to Virginia now that Maryland may be looking at raising their statewide minimum wage. What do you say to those who say DC uh, starting with minimum wage, we'll get to taxes and other things you've talked right. about, but starting with minimum wage, DC is not the place to open a business. Well, I believe you're seeing a nationwide approach to raising the minimum wage. Uh, it's a bill before Congress, the president supports it, and I think you're going to see a trend across the country on a state-by-state -state basis of uh, raising the minimum wage. The $7.25 uh, is, is just way too low. Ours was a dollar above it at eight twenty-five, And even that's too low in today's world. So yes, Virginia is going to always be a problem. They are uh, take a different approach. They're gonna probably keep their minimum wage down. And a, and a business that really wants to employ people at minimum wage probably won't come here because of that. But we will encourage businesses to come here for other reasons. And I believe we can compete successfully uh, with Maryland and Virginia, even if our minimum wage is a bit higher. So why is it that you think that when some of the big uh, companies look at relocating here, uh, they don't really look at D.C. proper, um, from Hilton to defense contractors, it's really Virginia and Maryland that seem to be in the game when it comes to attracting corporate headquarters. Why wouldn't big corporations want to have the nation's capital as their headquarters? Well, I would say it's, a, it's really a two-fold problem. Uh, first is the tax right out of the box. Uh, our corporate income tax stands at 9.975%. It's the highest in the region by far and the second highest in the nation. So when you compare that unfavorably with Virginia, who sits at 6%, that's almost a full 4% higher. And so when the North Grumman's and the General Dynamics, both of who I dealt with, and the Hilton's look to locate to the region, uh, they see that 4% and say, no, we're just going to go to Virginia. And even Maryland has raised their corporate tax rate now, so it's below ours, but 
not competitive again with Virginia. So that's as why as part of the uh, Tax Review Commission that Tony Williams put together, that I put together and Tony Williams chaired, uh, we're, we're looking at lowering that tax to be more competitive. But this is a fight you've been fighting for years. What makes you think you can do anything about it? I think there's two reasons we can do something about it. One, because it is a recommendation of the Williams Tax Commission. And that was a group of, uh, a whole dispirited group of different people. And for him to come forward with that, I think, gives it a lot more credibility. And secondly, we have money. Uh, we just re uh, realized a $139 million revenue re increase. And I sent a, mayor, uh, a letter to the, both the mayor and the chairman saying, we should use this money, which is found money, to lower those taxes, because it'll never come again that we can do this. So I think we have a chance this time. Uh, you know, a lot of people say that the surplus is very much needed for city services. Uh, I was with my own sons walking through downtown D.C. last night, and they were um, concerned by the number of homeless people that they saw walking through this city. A lot of people say that those taxes are needed um, and that the homeless problem has only grown under Mayor Gray. You have been criticized for not, in some people's words, being sympathetic enough to the problem of providing low-income housing. What do you say to your critics on that front? Oh, I, I would totally disagree with that. And, and my critics, you know, I just fail to recognize the dedication I've given to affordable housing. I was, along with Council Member Fenty and Mayor Williams, the, uh, the former of the uh, Housing Production Trust Fund. We put that together and then funded it with a dedicated funding source. Again, my idea using the deed and recordation tax and then when the deed and recordation tax declined because of the uh, slowdown in the economy, I mandated that money needed to be put in above that level. And today, we have $187 million being put into the fund this year, and that will produce affordable housing all across the city. And I think people just fail to recognize the role I play, played and continue to play in the creation of affordable housing. And it's not just the government doing it. I, it's every development project I put together that involves the government and the private sector mandate that the private sector must produce 35, maybe up to 50 percent of their units in affordable housing. And then you go beyond that. I was the proponent on the council to extend rent control for 10 years so our tenants in the city are protected. And beyond that is the property tax relief that I have garnered, not for all, just for our residents, but even for our seniors. The bill Anita Bonds uh, originally introduced that I moved through my committee and now the council has passed. And that bill says that if you are 70 years and older, have lived in the city 15 years, and earn less, less than $60,000, you don't pay any property taxes at all. So these are all components of the approach I've taken to make this a city affordable for everyone. You were on the attack against some of your opponents uh, recently at the debate that New Channel 8 hosted, uh, telling Tommy Wells that other members of the council don't like him. His defenders say that's because he's tried to get tough with the kind of pay-for-play uh, campaign donations that are seen as necessary uh, for developers here in Washington, D.C. Why criticize Tommy Wells for trying to clean up Washington politics? Uh, well, it wasn't directed at his uh, ethics approach to things. It was directed at his sanctimonious approach. And as I pointed out, aren't they in one that, and the same? <laughs> no. And I pointed out in that debate the reason uh, Tommy got that mantra of St. Tommy was because Kwame Brown, as chairman, took away Tommy's committee because uh, I don't know what the reasons were, and um, and no one rose to Tommy's defense because Tommy has always been a difficult person on the council to deal with and uh, not because of his, again, ethics things, just because he's difficult to deal with. And as a consequence, when nobody uh, rose to his defense, his local newspaper, The Hill Rag, anointed him at St. Tommy. And as I said to him, it wasn't because of your ethics approach, because just nobody liked you. <laughs> you did not sharply go after Mayor Gray in that debate, and uh, throughout the campaign, you have not been uh, a critic of the mayor. Um, some people say, why run for mayor if you, it's not to try and do better than the person who's got the job currently. Well, I think it's obvious why I, I want to be mayor instead of Mayor Gray, and it's because of the uh, federal investigation that uh, hangs over Mayor Gray's head and now has gotten even worse. 
the problem the mayor has now is not that he's not doing a good job, he's doing fine. And he and I have worked together for almost 25 years now. And when he was chairman of the council, I was vice chair, I don't think we ever lost a vote. Our approach to things are, are very similar, our financial approach, our economic development approach, affordable housing. He and I are the only two who give realistic answers at these debates, much to the chagrin of the people who are hooping and hollering and carrying on. And I think that's important. But the difference between the two of us clearly is this federal investigation. And I think the mayor, were he to win this primary, is going to get indicted at some point, And we are going to have a trial. And it's going to be a spectacle. And what I continue to say is the reason I would not support the mayor for mayor is because of that. Because we, have, we are starting to lose all of the goodwill and the image changing that we had done during the Tony Williams era where we changed the image of the city from that image of the Marion Barry era of you know, people who don't know what they're doing and being corrupt. And now, during the Fenty era, we started to slide back because of his antics. And now with Vince in his troubles, people are again looking at the District of Columbia like a city that is ungovernable. And, and I think that's just tragic for us. So that's why I want to be mayor. And we need, Rebecca, someone in this transition period, because we are facing a crisis here. Who knows what they're doing? It's when, like when John Wilson stepped up when Marion got arrested, or when Charlene Jarvis stepped up when uh, Dave Clark died. And I'm willing to step up now when Vince is in trouble, guide us through this difficult time, but with the wherewithal and the knowledge of how to run the city. And neither Tommy or Muriel have that. I think their election would only take a chaotic situation and make it worse. How do you rate your chances? I think they're good. Uh, again, we have less than two weeks left. And it's a, a fluid situation, to say the least. I mean, the events of last week only predict what could happen next week if the mayor were indicted. Uh, now the council member Barry, mayor for life, is endorsing Vince. Is that a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Is it going to galvanize the population? Can we get the big turnout uh, coming out to support me? Will people leave Vince and support me? So all those are questions we don't know the answers to. But as I present myself again to the public, I am the one with the knowledge the experience, the skill set to run this city today. And when I point that out to people and I say, look at Tommy, look at Muriel, no one believes they can be mayor today. The uphill learning curve is going to be enormous. They're going to have to rely on cadres of advisors, something I don't have to do. And so if Vince is unable to be mayor because of the challenges he faces, which I believe he is unable to do that, I become the best choice. You've talked to him privately. Have you called on? Have you told him privately it's time for him to get out of the race? No, I have not, and I haven't talked to him privately in a long time. Uh, again, we see each other at the forums and, and are friendly and, and continue to work together on issues, but no, I have not discussed the election with him. Jack Evans, good luck as the race continues. Oh, well, thank Thanks you so much. Thanks for joining no, us. No, thank you for having me. That's great.